Okay. Um, so I'm just going to pass it over to Cody. Um, hi, can everyone? Mm -hmm. I am muted, but, but oh, yeah. can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so before we enter this, this online event, um, just to kind of provide some, some calm into your day, um, mm -hmm. we'd really like to settle in breaths together. Um, this is a practice in, in some South Asian traditions to support um, calm abiding, shamatha, and uh, insight, vipassana, um, and that's something that we welcome here. Um, so we'd like to invite everyone to take 17 breaths, um, just to place ourselves in what brings us collectively here, um, and to set an intention and to be with whatever arises and passes. Um, this won't be guided. You're really welcome to take those 17 breaths in your own time. And if we start back up and you're still going, that's absolutely okay. Finish in your own time. Um, so we're just going to leave a moment to take some breaths now. Okay, um, yeah, apologies for the slight disruption to the 17 breaths. Um, hopefully that didn't disturb you too much. Um, so um, just to get started, um, those of you who are new to OPP, um, we're a journal space uh, for critically questioning what philosophy is and how we're doing it in form and in content. Um, we welcome work that investigates received assumptions about the nature and aims of philosophical inquiry, including contributions that questions the structural norms of currently dominant research programs. So welcome also to the OPP journal Turn 2 launch. Um, with an aesthetic of revolutionary moon and sunrise meeting in a vortex, um, welcome whether you join us at night or day perceived from your location. Turn 2 reflects on the themes of Africana and South Asian philosophies, as well as the value and the values of our education. Um, with turn two, we also look back to turn one um, to thank those who gave spirit and character to this public philosophizing initiative. Um, OPP co-founder and co-organizer Alice Hank Winham has written a few words um, on the inspiration and the driving force behind our collective, as well as specifically the themes of um, Turn 2. Um, she is with us um, here today, um, but um, we'll read out what she's put together for you. Okay, okay. Um, so the words of Alice Hank. Uh, Alice Crary, one of our academic advisors here at OPP, told us to envision more when we first began to consider a virtual space for student philosophizing beyond the classroom at Oxford in the form of a journal. There was and is no undergraduate group space for discussing philosophy beyond the classroom. Our time, space and institutions are, are focused on particular forms and contents um, that despite some virtues also pervasively drown out and shame not only voices and narratives but lives. Institutional silencing and the erasure and omission of experience 
and different forms of reasoning have devastating and insidious effects in our world, we can better understand and remedy these constructed borders ingrained in evaluative systems and in norms of academia and public speech and behavior and in our curricula and classrooms by creating a space to explicitly examine these beyond our contained horizons. These limiting forces may manifest themselves differently between institutions, so we begin where we are to endeavor to take a step beyond our confines, grateful for and in investigating the powerful resources and positions we find ourselves in, to invite others to a joint public space with us. We hope to continue to nuance and challenge our interpretive horizons, from reasoning practices and logic and analytic arguments, to forms of communication and expression, to ethical action and transformative world participation. This is not easy and we thank you for joining us, whether teaching us as contributors or joining for discussions or plotting with our philosophy team. Um, to continue those words, um, we return then also to thank the speakers for our turn one launch, for setting our team off spinning in inspiration at the event which also initiated a theories of nonviolent revolution series hosted by People for Women in Philosophy, our parent organization. Lee A. McBride III, Jack A. Goldstone, and Leonard Harris ignited an energy that stayed with us and which we felt again in another selection of speakers from that series, who are also our speakers tonight and contributors to turn to. Thoughts of revolutionary work and transformative philosophy inform these discussions. We welcome back circles of reflection in inviting them here in this ongoing spin around the sun, since climactic activity prevented them from speaking together earlier this year. We are so excited to continue the conversation looking to the sunrise. Finally, a note on our turn two themes. Expanding our horizons has no set trajectory and surely demands and imperatives will differ depending on social and geographical spatial positions. Um, we cannot claim that we will ever seek in a correct way. We endeavor to learn as we go without a set path or paths looking to teachers around the world. We turn to turn through two themes uh, from our positions to more critically bring to our students' eye and to our own understanding uh, to the new undergraduate Indian philosophy paper at Oxford and to the In Search of Zero Yakov conference now scheduled for spring 2022, bringing together leading global scholars on some early modern Ethiopian texts. Um, we sought to understand their significance and to broaden their contexts. As caring students, we sought to understand the traditions and terms given to us. The Black Lives Matter protests and pandemic inequities shape this broader context. The sentient beings experiencing and giving testimony to these phenomena give life to the values of our education seeking and the ensuing transformative potentials and actualities we have found in compiling this turn, which only just brings a fresh wave to our attention in our learning lives. Um, yeah, finally, um, on behalf of Alice Hank, um, thank you all our team and contributors who made this turn possible. Um, I guess that's also on my and everyone else's behalf. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and thank you, Alice Hank, for putting that together for us. Um, so just a little bit more of um, an agenda. So we're going to start um, by hearing some poetry um, from Taig Kwasi. Um, and we'll have a conversation um, with the artist um, about their writing um, and then we will we'll see where, where the night takes us. We might take a quick break. Um, but afterwards, we'll be hearing from what we call, or who we call the ACON editors, um, who've written a piece for us um, entitled um, Decolonizing Philosophy Now, something like that. Um, and we'll be hearing from them about their personal experiences um, inspired by the OPP aesthetic of the revolutionary sunrise. Um, so without further ado, um, we'll hand it over to you, Taik. Um, please um, turn on your mic and talk to us and inspire us with your poetry. Taik? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, I forgot if I was... Hello? Yeah. Hello. Testing. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear us? 
Um, hi, nice to meet you all. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, oh, yes, thank you for hosting. Um, I forgot if I was performing one or two poems, but I'll perform this one first. It's called Black Panther. Um, here it goes. This grip the oppressors have on the systems are tightened and raised black fists, but the movement moves on like gymnasts. We fall under the gun sorts and revive like a phoenix, but straight from the mix. Headless chickens get stricken down from all angles. What a Martin or Huey do? A kingdom without his king and a planet without Newton. So many elements is bound to follow gravity, but according to law, you must move with the force you strike us with. The revolution was not televised, but digitized and commodified. Gentrified, bowed, and packaged into black furs, then left behind. Thank you for listening. That was our first piece, uh, Black Panther. Thank you so much, Taig. Um, so um, just to introduce Taig um, to all of our attendees here today. Um, so Taig is a Sheffield-based and Ghanaian-born Irish poet and philosophy student whose work touches on the introspective and the existential aspects of experience, particularly the Black experience and mental health. Um, so Taig has contributed um, two pieces to, to turn to. Um, Black Panther, the one he's just read for us, um, and another poem called Colour Isolation. Um, hi, Philly and Ty, do you want to read another one for us? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, this next piece has, um, is your name Val? As Val uh, said, it's called Colour Isolation. Um, here goes none. Feeling the aftershocks of colonization is these days not so much breathing, more suffocation. My identity is broken just like our ancestries. Family lines torn apart into slave and subjugation. Conquering the divided, the roots of my identity are torn in my family tree. Now I'm watching roots to trace our broken ancestry. The bar driven out by slavery and subjugation. The bar derided, the nation conquered and divided. Am I road enough to walk through roads and call these cobble pavements home? I wanted to be a black Gatsby getting gold before they ask me where I'm from. Cold twitching tongues on calculating the sum my answer, erring between the slang and the proper. White labels suspend me to bang drums and my bread and want me in the same nightmare. Cycles of other and internalized till we're blinded to the bigger picture. You got all, all hyped and I step in backwards, cap tracksuit and tongue full of jive. This cold twitching keeps the brain busy, buzzing, a hive of brutal thoughts. Still, you call me a little because I don't care what you thought. I speak in different degrees of ABCs because you're part of the seven seas in search of us with slave labor. Make it illegal to read. Make us hate our black neighbors. You wonder why I don't care to lend my ears to Shakespeare. Want to spit wit and throw bricks. Hear you speak and it stinks. Waves of bullshit appropriated our culture and in the same breath announced it. It's so frustrating when you're the one who separated and then baited us with false promises. Then you poison us and try to sleep under the rug, no wind wash. So when I say cause don't hush me, you never even bothered to teach your adopted kids how to survive here. But we're going to find a way to if you leave us out to dry. Don't call me patriotic because I decided to master what the masses know. Brothers and sisters label me white because I love to write to make use of my syllabus. What we're sold in is the same. We're all riding in the back of the bus. I'm stuck between switching tongues and being myself, particularly yet still in the bottom societal set. Look what happened when you forgot our roots and let them tailor labels for us like suits. They all behave like a stolen song, but it's still set in motion. Am I still a dirty nigger or nah? Just a shade defined by pound figures, fatten me up and sell me to the highest bidder. Cycles continue when nobody changes. The policeman who killed me sniggers that I'm a nigger who dreamed of Black Gatsby but I think his apathy was greater than mine. He had decided to slack and stay in the bubble. That's just what has to be done. This black palm convinced he cannot move to white spaces. He is trapped in his false color game. A shame. What did the oppressor see when I set off for Africa, motherland? I wonder how you'd feel if you saw the grand disaster we're in. But then again, this is no unity. It's one for all of us can fall. This ball is still in motion, but where's the devotion to Martin's cause? You bend it and scrap it like straws. Thank you for listening. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Ty. Um, um, I have one final bit of kind of introductory material um, to Tyg's poems to read um, by B. Ratliff, um, his, who was his editor. Um, unfortunately, B couldn't be here today. Um, so she sent on to me what she had prepared um, to say. Um, and these are B's words. I've had the pleasure of working with Tyg on two of the poems which he submitted as a part of the turn two collection process, Black Panther and Color Isolation. Both of these pieces focus masterfully on Tyg's experience of racial identity, both in the context of Ghana, where he was born, and in Britain, where he has been studying philosophy at the University of Sheffield. Mental health works its way through both pieces as an element which naturally follows along with his conceptualization of his own identity. Um, thanks very much for um, reading to us, Taig. Um, um, I think we'll now proceed to kind of a uh, conversation um, with you about what inspired you um, to write these poems, um, what um, your process of putting these together, um, and also your your experience um, of philosophy, um, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so first of all, um, I think one one thing that strikes me a lot, um, especially as you just read out these poems, um, is that kind of sound and musicality feature so heavily um, in in your poems in your work. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how music inspires you or how you kind of put that feature, especially in certain lines of, of your poems that you've read today? Um, in terms of music and musicality, I guess um, it comes from my biggest influence in terms of writing and um, just being able to articulate my experiences is listening to hip hop and rap music. I guess yeah, growing up, that's why like the first kind of music I heard and what I was listening to and it's what inspired me to write poetry and listening to artists such as Tupac Shakur, NWA, Ice Cube, Kendrick Lamar, J. Cole, and um, kind of influenced me to make sense of my experiences that I couldn't really understand. Because um, growing up um, in predominantly uh, by countries like Ireland and uh, England, there's experiences of racism or discrimination. And sometimes as a kid, you don't really understand it. And it helped me listen to that music, taught me many, uh, a lot of stuff. And my style, I guess, of poetry and journey getting into poetry was just influenced by listening to hip hop and the rhythmic style and the rhymes. I guess the, my favorite parts of poetry is the rhythm and rhymes and stuff. So yeah, listening to hip hop and rap music has definitely influenced and inspired me to, to start writing to begin. I mean, I used to journal my thoughts a lot. I just used to journal and then I thought one day, like after listening to some music, well, maybe I should just try rhyming some words together and rhyme my thoughts and feelings and see what happens. And that's how it started, really. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I, I agree for, for me as well, the most interesting part of poetry, I think, um, is the the language and how the sounds come come together. Um, so just just to kind of build um, on on what you've just said, um, I mean, what what do you think? Where does the line between poetry and music lie for you? I mean, maybe that's not a line that really exists. What what do you think? Uh, for me, sometimes uh, I think the line is very much arbitrary because for me. The music I listen to, I argue that hip hop is a form of poetry. A lot of just the messages they weave into the the rhymes, into the rhymes they say, and just the storytelling, the metaphors that have all drawn um, poetic devices and techniques to tell stories and stuff. So, and for me, music, I guess uh, the, the line for me is a bit arbitrary. Like I just call it spoken word of poetry because it's not really on a beat or instrumental it's not really a music and sometimes I I do box myself out of like I, I sometimes I write and write something I box myself out of poetry because I was just thinking is this really poetry because it seems a bit too raw or visual because the subject matter is not about nature or, or butterflies or whatever or my like and uh, yeah sometimes in the past I often thought uh, what, what, am I, what is this thing I'm writing like because the subject matter doesn't really 
match what I typically learn to GCSE, Shakespeare, or like I really, although I did like some poetry I learned at school, like Percy Shelley's or Ozymandias, like poetry I wrote and the music I listened to was very different from that. It's in subject matter, but the line, I guess, I, I just say like, uh, as obviously, as you noticed, I tried to pack some rhythm and musicality into my um, uh, poetry, but yeah, I guess instrumentals and music is pretty much the difference, I guess. Mm. Yeah, um, I love the I love the line of the subject matter doesn't matter. I think um, that's definitely an inspiring line, and I hope someone will come up with something tonight that we can put on the blog because um, I think that's that's a great line um, and also I mean the fact that um, you're asking yourself um, the sorts of questions of is this poetry or is this music you know um, I think that's great um, and I'm sure it's why you kind of like make a great fit for, for OPV um, we hope everyone's out there asking these questions and that those these are the questions that we really want to raise um, so on to kind of like another question um, I had for you um, is that your poem Black Panther um, speaks to especially kind of to the black liberation movement um, in the US um, and kind of in your in your bio right you're from all these different places um, and kind of this theme of identity um, you raise that a lot in your poetry as well um, and I was wondering um, how what is your relationship um, to kind of the US um, African American Black Liberation Movement um, as someone born in Ghana who is also Irish and also British. Um, what is your relationship to these different movements around the world? Um, my relationship is, I guess, a relationship of, uh, okay, there's two aspects to this. One is a deep, deep empathy and a deep empathy and uh, what's the word? A deep empathy and a deep connection with their struggle and their pains and the fact that um, that could have been easily me, that could have been easily me there because I remember growing up like my dad um, when I did live with him. He was always trying so hard to get us a green card to emigrate there. He really wanted us to live there. And I guess my connect and I have a few family members over there. And it's just it's just so inspiring and so heartbreaking to see them go through and to see in their history books to see that people like me, um, ancestors have gone to such horrible experiences. So just yeah that's the first level I guess just emp deep empathy um and yeah I think it's th there's another level to it where it's just like these movements were are so inspiring to me how the experience suffered so much and yet they fought so hard to for the liberation of um black people all over the world and they just they had to fight so hard just for human rights and respect and it deeply upsets me every time I saw Shavon Martin or George Floyd or to see or to see in the history of books people like me were lynched and considered less than human killed um yeah and so for me it's just yeah deep inspiration to see how hard they fought and for freedom and equality and um, and most of the culture I consumed, I guess, was from America, like, was American centric because majority of Black representation was from American media, whether it was hip hop, acting, even politics, America definitely was me consuming a culture. I did notice more representation in America, so I did, was drawn to it, but at the same time, did feel like something was off because often they were boxed into these roles of the thug. I mean, for as a look at the males for a role model, like those they're boxed into criminals, thugs, gangsters and stuff. And and then on the other side seeing them struggle and see talking their experiences of oppression and stuff and 
So I think the Black Panther Party, um, at first I thought I just, I heard of the Black Panther Party as opposed to like, a kind of group to a Malcolm X initially, like it was growing up educated in the UK, you, you don't really hear much about um, Mark, Malcolm X or the Black Panther Party, apart from the con- in the context of they were violent militant people who were opposed to Martin Luther King's passage. But it wasn't as simple as that when I looked into it, done my research and started listening. It was, um, I listened to a lot of Tupac Shakur, I done my research on politics and stuff, and as I got more political, um, found out about the truth of the matter and how the Black Panther Party were generally doing good for the community, educating the children, feeding them, and doing so much good. So that, yeah, seeing them struggle and seeing how, like Fred Hampton, for example, was organizing um, like the whites, the Latinos and stuff to organize for, to fight for equal rights and do stuff. And then how he's assassinated at the age of 21 and just, and all these uh, black leaders were systematically targeted by the FBI, assassinated or just threatened. Uh, yeah, all that stuff, it, yeah, inspires me. And yeah, just a deep sadness to see what they're going through. And yeah, and that's what the descendants of slaves are, are reduced to just, less than human, which is still the case, as you can see from George Floyd and his treatment by the police. But yeah, uh, ramble a lot. <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question. Um, yeah, I mean, thanks thanks for, for sharing that with us. Um, and I'm sure that um, our ACON editors here today are kind of like itching to, to, to say something about um, kind of Martin Luther King um, and and the Panthers, um, and we'll we'll hear a lot from them um, later on as well. So I hope I hope you're you're all able to stay to to kind of continue this um, conversation. Um, I would kind of now like to open um, questions um, to all of our audience here today. So um, if you have a question for Tig, please raise your Zoom hand um, or post something in the chat or somehow make yourself known as wanting to ask a question um, and we'll call on you. Um, and kind of before, um, to give people some some time to think about anything that they would like to ask, um, I have one, one last question um, that I've prepared as well. Um, again, I think in connection um, to the Black Liberation Movement in, in the US um, and also to, to link to what um, the ACORN editors are, are here to us um, to talk to us about today. Um, so I wanted to ask you about your experience specifically of studying philosophy um, and especially kind of in the light um, of these, these liberation movements and especially a lot of kind of student movements, especially to kind of decolonize the curriculum um, and how you feel that has impacted both kind of your, your experience as a student of philosophy um, as well as your, your work as, as an artist. Um, high experiences of philosophy. Um, okay, so how I first got into philosophy was um by basically just watching like I've always had an interest in like knowing about the world and having knowledge about the world and kind of yeah, just knowing about the world, I guess. And um I always watch the I watch the loads of YouTube videos and like the flood wisecrack and stuff or floss YouTube and stuff. All really got me fascinated was um reading uh John Paul Sartre um existentialism as a humanism because I grew up as a Christian and um as a child I just I don't know something about reading the Bible and stuff and reading all these outlandish stories just didn't click. I guess that sparked a bit of a the critical thinker, I mean, just thinking, is this like because I just saw the gap between the Bible and the, the material world around me? And I was just, yeah, and I was always just curious about, yeah, things in the world. And reading existentialism really, I really connected with because as a person who struggled with identity and a person who's been from country to country, um, I always questioned 
a like I just question my value as a human being with counterbalance onto all those experiences and stuff. So that sparked my interest in philosophy, and I study. Yeah, I chose to study philosophy at Sheffield, and I really was drawn to philosophy because of how broad it is. Because you learn about ethics, religion, you question everything, um, death, what is a life worth living. I studied film and philosophy, all these type of things, and my experience in, con- in the context of Black liberation, I guess I broadly learned that the knowledge about knowledge and how education is and how the systems are structured so that you learn things from a certain point of view. I mean, I learned this in GCSE history, but like this really hit home when I studied philosophy because seeing how you're centric and how you're centric on enlightenment was and how ignored even stuff like Eastern philosophy and all the, yeah, I guess I realized that and like, it seems uh, Rizzo, uh, John Locke, all these 18th century, 19th century philosophers speak about freedom and human human democracy and all these good values, but they, they had slaves. Some of them are racist, some of them justified. People like me are savages. We have no culture. Africa has no history. Seeing that just, yeah, you know, just obviously got me frustrated because I didn't see any black philosophers really in my first two years of my degree. I mean, yeah, predominantly in my first two years of my degree, like I only recently discovered about Franz Fanon, the amazing psychoanalyst and psychiatrist and um and guy and just amazing thinker who was was a pretty much unique thinker. He was influenced by Hegel, Freud, and uh, existentialism, and Sartre, and he pretty much gives a comprehensive analysis of the psychological effects of colonialism. Never even heard of him before university, and discovering him, discovering um, Du Bois, discovering how radical Martin Luther King actually was in his thinking, discovering how philosophically he was, like, I had to really dig deep outside of my career and to really feel it, uh, find this out. And yeah, and researching the Black liberation movements, I just, yeah, I figured out how to see philosophy where there wasn't even philosophy, because academic philosophy, especially universities, the analytic continental divide, just like all these Black movements generally have philosophy, like the 10 point program of the Black Panther Party. And just find out about um, Pan Africanism. Um, Karma and Kuma, who's uh, my dad often spoke about, but I didn't really re- research him until I found out that he was actually a philosopher and a Pan Africanist. So, yeah, um, the curriculum at Sheffield is pretty de- decent, to be fair. Like in the feminist module, we looked at many Black authors in a feminist context, like we looked at um, Angela Davis, Bell Hooks and stuff like that, and this module I'm doing right now, but we looked at MLK and Malcolm X and really dug deep into the philosophies and and really digging deep into analyzing and digging out the philosophy from the speeches. And yeah, I think, um, yeah, from and just looking at BLM, I just, yeah, I've been drawn to looking for alternative thoughts. Like I've recently done a research project uh, with my university called uh, Hip Hop and the White Gaze, um, how hip hop has fought the white gaze. So I drew on Du Bois and concept of double consciousness and the veil and Fanon's um, concepts to argue that hip hop is illegitimate uh, form of art that's fought the white gaze. I got to interview some hip hop artists to get their opinion on it and stuff like that in our university has allowed me to really search out and explore anti-colonial and something, yeah, post-colonial thought, which is something I never even thought about, how to really um, navigate um, the Black experience in the post-colonial world. I've definitely been having thoughts on that since I came to university, but I really had to um, do a lot of the research and reading on my own, but yeah.
Mm, yeah, that's really um, that's really interesting. I think um, a lot of connections here as well. Um, again, to the Acorn um, piece um, themes, um, I'm sure that um, Anthony Shonio has a lot here to say about kind of um, existentialism and, and humanism um, as an informed way to to experience life, um, especially um, in the light of these Black liberation movements. Um, and um, Gail Presby's piece as well um, really kind of like makes a point of um, kind of studying certain kind of canonical authors um, without their social baggage, um, you know, of kind of like when you read Kant um, and kind of he goes on and on about um, kind of universal human rights and treating everyone as an end in itself. Um, yeah, he has these insane ideas about who gets to be treated as an end in itself. Um, I mean, how can that, how can that be um, an ethics class um, when we, we ignore um, real life issues that affect people today? Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you for, for sharing that, Ty. Um, I just wanted to um, reiterate again um, that if you have any questions, um, please um, do um, put them in the chat. Um, I have, um, oh, yeah, Anthony Sean, you, you have a question? <laughs> yeah, yes, I do. Um, and I'm, I apologize because I couldn't find my, the hand to uh, raise it. I'm looking for it. No worries, yeah. <laughs> Somewhat of an old fogey there. Uh, Todd, uh, wonderful uh, poetry. I, I, I really appreciate uh, much of what you said and, um, mm -hmm. and, and just good poetry. Uh, having spent uh, many summers in Ghana, um, I've not been to Ireland, but I have been to Scotland and, and England and things of that nature. So I've kind of gone around the world and know some of the places that you uh, mentioned. I, I'm interested that you didn't mention, um, what is it, high life music or whatever. You didn't uh, throw that in also as, as an influence. But I, I do have a question. And one of my questions would be, um, having been a part of the uh, first generation of hip hop uh, listeners, um, you know, I was born in 1969 which makes me uh, right in the middle of Generation X and those who uh, were the first listeners and first people to appreciate hip hop music. Um, when I was growing up, hip hop music was, was underground. You had to know somebody who could pass a tape from a, a DJ. So it was not played on the radio. Uh, I'm always interested in uh, when I hear the, the next generation because you're the first generation to grow up with um, where hip hop is mainstream and it is a, um, a dominant music form. Uh, my, my, my main question would be, what is your uh, critique of, of hip hop? And, and, and let me explain what I, what I mean by that. So much of hip hop has been commodified and, and uh, the, the music industry, uh, certainly just like any other industry, uh, exports. That, that's part of what it does, right? So it's going to present a certain understanding of black life and take that to be uh, to be the black life itself, right? And, yeah. and so that uh, when you think of um, uh, one of the things that hip hop sells um, or exploits poverty, right? So, so there's a way in which um, when you understand black American life, we can take that, if, we, if, you, if you just take a picture that is presented by hip hop, that is one particular picture, but particularly uh, even Tupac, and I, I like Tupac, particularly the things that he wrote before 96. But one of the things that he, he uh, um, I mean, because he died in 96, but the, the early stuff that he writes, but one of the things that he even said was that he took what he had, which was poverty, and sold it, right? And, and, tried, and, and so I'm asking, my question would be, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be necessarily a Marxist critique or whatever, but, but certainly the, I, I think that there would have to be some critique of, of, of hip hop um, in, in, as far, in as far as how it explores a particular type of culture and prints that as Black or African-American culture? Yeah. Um, thank you for that question, Anthony. Um, yeah, definitely my critique of hip hop would be definitely how it um, over exploits and especially the market and the audience because now it's the biggest genre, I think. And even doing my research into history, because as you, I'm a, yeah, I was born in 2000. So I'm a 
few generations after for sure so like um yeah very much doing my research i've seen how like and just growing up gangster rap drill music representations of hyper masculine black males as thugs gangsters and all these negative connotations that they bring misogynistic violent they kind of saturate this image of blackness and as for the black male that's what you have to be it kind of creates this environment and this image of like uh, of you have to be the black man and blackness is only this your buck kind of boxed into this um this archetype of what you can be and i think yeah hip-hop due to I argue it's due to the market, but also just, yeah, the market demand for, and just general, just, it's, there's also other factors involved in it, but yeah, the thug, the gangster, the drug dealer, the hyper, yeah, this thing is highly overselled and the market demand is there. And that's what is expected for black males. Like a lot of white people, because hip hop, is mainstream became mainstream and kind of hip hop is an art form. It's a music form, so it travels. It was for a lot of white people and a lot of people, and even for me as a black person in my context, I was raised in Ireland and uh, in, in Britain. Are uh, a lot of people's first impressions or first contact with black African Americans is through the music. So you have expectation that, for example, like Chicago. You have the expectation that inner city Chicago is just full of gangs killing each other with the influence of Chief Keef and the drill music and all this. That's my critique. And like until Kanye West came along, it wasn't acceptable to be like things like that. Yeah, like the archetypes they created for it's only acceptable to be this kind of black man. You you can't talk about your emotions. You can't talk about your feelings. It's not acceptable to work in a nine to five. You should be hustling stuff like, yeah, I guess that's my critique of, yeah, because it's, it's straight away from where it started, as you may know, Anthony, like it was supposed to be that way. Hip hop as started was just, uh, was completely different to where it turned towards the mid nineties. And then now we're seeing a different shift of a lot of rappers, as you may know, the mumble rapper trend rapping about doing drugs, doing lean and stuff. Um, yeah, it's taken some turns to our form. And now that it's all mainstream, most of the audiences are white. And even when you have rappers who are authentic, you talk about their experiences, the black experiences are talking about conscious hip hop, like Kendrick Lamar. You got a bunch of people in the audience who expect one thing and they're not even connecting or trying to understand what he's trying to say. But yeah, that's my yeah. That, I would say that's my critique of hip hop as an author. It can be very rigid, but it is. Yeah, it does straight like similar to how Tupac, like Tupac is a big example. Like he was a he was the son of two uh, Black Panthers, and he had that at the start. He had that Afrocentric, he had that message, that political message. But then he. Two to your circumstances and the market demand, it evolved into gangster rap and stuff, but and, which is very unfortunate. But yeah, I appreciate that. I and just to follow up, you know, one of the things I would caution, um, most black people as being from New York, LA and Chicago. Well, that, that's one, that's a very small picture of, of African-Americans, right? And, mm. and if you, and so that's why the tradition tended to be early on gospel music, R&B and music about love. So even when you think of hip hop, you only find very few love songs, right? Mm. And which, which is a strange mix if you say for any type of music, but, but certainly because it comes out of the pathos, right? So you only have a few love songs. That's a very interesting uh, dynamic. I just throw that in. But thank you. Thank you for the question, Anthony. 
Um, thanks. Yeah, this is really interesting. Um, a few weeks ago, um, we had um, an OPP event on um, music. Um, and yeah, Gre Greg Moses was, was there as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's really, really interesting, especially so we had Warwick, Warwick Moses was, was speaking to us um, about Afrofuturism um, and music. Um, and I think, um, you know, that's that maybe is a is a maybe a more hopeful way of, of kind of like closing closing this discussion um, on on hip hop um, and representation. Um, that um, and again um, with Andrea's comment also um, that hip hop still contains multitudes and is in certain instances quite a revolutionary act. Um, I'm sure. Um, I mean, do, do, do you want to, to pick that up, Taig, um, this idea of the revolutionary act, um, and especially poet, poetry as well, um, is also yeah. a revolutionary act, right? Definitely. Um, picking up on what Andrea has um, brilliantly pointed out and put in the chat, it still contains multitudes and in certain instances, revolutionary acts. Yeah, I definitely uh, think so as well. I think um, despite the over-representation of, of um, gangster acts and gangster rappers and the, over, the focus on the negative aspects of the Black experience, such as the struggle, living in ghettos and living in um, bad conditions. I think hip-hop definitely has been and can be a revolutionary force because it produced artists such as Public Enemy, um, Africa Bombarda, um, the X Clan it produced um, De La Soul, Common, um, Kendrick Lamar, obviously. And in the UK, we have Santa and Dave and Jay Huss reclaiming blackness, excluding Stormzy, who've used the, the art form to reclaim blackness and reclaim some sense of pride in being African American or a black person in these contexts, is being a, a tool for educating on things like the Black Panther and racism and institutional racism and talk about their experiences of racism allows and talking about their negative experiences in these conditions allows listeners to realize what's actually going on and to have confidence in themselves. I think although there's a lot of the negative sides, it is a positive off from that is inherently anti-establishment and it does bring um, their political message so yeah i think hip-hop has does have its revolutionary moments and aspects and it can be revolutionary it's just unfortunately it's uh, end of the day it's a oh, it's a music art form and it's in the music industry and whoever gets signed whoever gets record label deals and whoever's viable is depends on the whims in the market to record labels and I definitely do not want to hear revolutionary themes. Revolution is the last thing they want to hear. Mm, yeah, um, I think, yeah, at least we kind of live in a world where the internet can take you anywhere. Um, so I think um, that's one way in which I think, you know, um, very revolutionary artists um, still push push that message, um, which I think is really valuable. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Tig, um, for sharing. Um, I think Andrea, did you have um, another follow up question um, that you wanted to ask? Um, you can turn on your microphone and your camera. Yeah. Um, hi everyone. I'm sorry I won't turn on my camera because I'm in a really dark place and um, <laughs> I feel like it would just be really annoying. Um, thank you all for this lovely event. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to say um, in connection to the hip hop conversation, not to uh, extend it too long. Um, the uh, website that I dropped in chat um, is um, the official website of uh, Professor A.D. Carson, who is also a hip hop artist, and he actually wrote his um, master's dissertation as a hip hop album called um, Owning My Masters. And um, 
I had the pleasure of interviewing him this summer for Passengers Journal, and we had a lovely conversation exactly about hip hop as revolution, and uh, particularly about how hip hop is has historically been a tool for exposing the status quo. And that's basically what art does. And it just so happens that the status quo of that particular community that hip hop rose from was connected to violence, drugs, and um, it was created by socioeconomic circumstances that were not necessarily related to what the artists wanted to promote as art. It was just um, an expression of what they were living. We all take a walk and we take pretty pictures with our phones. And this was similar to that. It was, that's where they lived and that's what they expressed. And one of the most interesting things that uh, Professor Carson said during the interview was that revolution doesn't have to sound like um, fuck the police or it doesn't have to have that angry message. Sometimes revolution can just be existing in a room, um, just being in the room um, as a person of color, which I thought was an amazing thing. And I think from that perspective, hip hop should keep its moment and should, um, um, even though there is the commercial aspect of it as there is, if, if you go to his website, he just released an album this year called I Used to Love to Dream. Um, and it's basically poetry and the flow of the album is, is really amazing. There, there's a song in there that's absolutely heartbreaking that also has a video, it's called Just In Case. And there are histories to um, all of the songs on that album. And to me, that is a beautiful example of um, hip hop as exposing the status quo current, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement um, and still current events and being political and articulate and intelligent and having a place in poetry, just crossing that bridge, building that bridge, um, even, even stronger than it has been. Um, so that's just, I just wanted to, uh, to explain my, my comment. Um, I didn't wanna take over the conversation. Thank you so much for listening. Um, thank you so much for that, um, Andrea. That was amazing. I agree with you hundred percent. Like I just, yeah, doing my research on uh, on the off from um, this year, I just I found uh, like, for example, gangster rap wasn't even a term coined by any of the artists involved in it. It was just turned by the media. They were just, as you said, rapping about the realities that America, white America, wanted to hide and wanted to ignore. They were just rapping about the like a star with Schoolie D and Ice T, just rapping about the abject conditions of the communities. And then white listeners got a listen to NWA who did glorify a tad bit, but they were just rapping about the realities that what that America ignored and the socioeconomic conditions caused in the ghettos. And obviously the white audience bought that up and most of the listeners were white audience who didn't be articulated and and then the media obviously jumped on it and and just blew up a portion saying these people are glorifying and this violence and stuff but yeah I think yeah hip-hop is truly I'm glad it is an often that provides a space for um black people and African and African Americans to talk about their experiences, as as opposed to what is the status quo. But thank you so much for your thoughts, Andrea. I'll definitely check out um, AD that what you said sounded so interesting. I'll definitely check him out tonight. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Um, definitely sounds super interesting. Um, we're APP, you know, we're always pushing for. 
um, different forms of philosophizing. So um, a hip hop album thesis sounds like definitely our kind of thing. Uh, so thanks, thanks very much for sharing. Um, so, and thank, thank you very much for sharing, Tig. Um, this has been a really interesting um, Q&A session. Um, and thank you for sharing your, your poetry with us. Um, I hope you all, all um, go and read it um, after, after the event today um, and ponder, ponder some more, yeah. Um, we'll take a quick break now, um, just before we um, move on to the Acorn Editors conversation. Um, so we'll play another tune from the Turn 2 playlist. Um, and yeah, do, you know, get up, stretch, walk for a bit, um, and we'll be back in about two minutes. Um, so yeah, see you, see you in a bit, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to hope, well, all of our, our Acorn editors are back, so I, I'm going to take that as a sign that we're ready to, to start back up again. Um, thanks, thanks again to, to Tig for sharing um, and for all of your interesting questions um, and all your interesting answers. Um, so I'll turn over to, to Cody now um, for an introduction to, to the Acorn piece for, for today. Great. Uh, fantastic. Uh, so our next set of speakers are Greg Moses, Anthony Sean Neal, and Gail Presby, all of whom in some capacity edit the ACORN, Philosophical Studies in Pacifism and Nonviolence. The ACORN is a peer-reviewed scholarly journal devoted to the philosophical examination of the theory and practice of activism, nonviolence, organizing, pacifism, and resistance, especially related to examples such as Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., Cesar Chavez, and Jane Addams. Um, work in uh, the work in turn two um, that we are delighted to uh, have found a home kind of at, at OPP, we're very excited to be hosting it, is uh, Decolonizing Philosophy Without Further Delay, which is a response to an open letter written by Oxford students in the summer of 2020, which urged the philosophy faculty to make changes to the curriculum to include other voices and traditions in the history of philosophy. The contributions of the ACORN editors are reflections on the state of philosophy as a discipline, as well as on specific topics and parts of its history, such as ethics and African-American thought. Their contributions are also personal reflections on their experiences of philosophy, philosophizing and teaching in the US. Uh, Greg, Anthony and Gail have all put a lot of thought into their presentation for us today, uh, which will take the form of a conversation that we have tentatively titled this is not the first summarize, direct visions for transformational philosophy. Uh, mindful of the OPP turn to aesthetic of the revolutionary sunrise over water and in response to our invitation to be more experimental in form, they have taken inspiration from blues people and the jazz tradition by playing to a rising sun rather than a setting one. For Greg, Anthony and Gail, the rising represents a promise, a promise for the return of face-to-face -face philosophy and for a transformation of philosophy in the wake of the Black Lives Matter actions of 2020. In the face of this sunrise, they will share stories with us that reflect on face-to-face -face encounters, the turbulent world in which we live, and the exodus from Plato's cave. Um, so please do uh, take to the floor. Um, we invite you to, to start the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Cody. Uh, thank you very much, Val. Uh, thank you, Tadik, for such a, a wonderful hour in, uh, that we experienced prior to this. And uh, all to the, to the other good folks at um, Oxford Public Philosophy that we've been corresponding with, I guess, now for about a, a year or so. Um, and we, we've enjoyed the relationship and, and uh, we're really happy to be part of the, the Turn 2 uh, journal. We thought that, that instead of sort of explicitly focusing on what we presented in our writing, uh, which everyone will soon be able to read, that 
we would think about the situation in another way. And, and, and so one thing that, that comes to mind is, uh, as we think about the kind of struggle that uh, we're in the middle of here, trying to diversify philosophy and decolonize philosophy, that um, we're looking for a sunrise, but it, it's not the first one. And we have stories of sunrises past to share. So to begin, uh, we'd like to ask uh, Dr. Anthony Sean Neal uh, to take us back to the, a sunrise of the 60s. Uh, Anthony, you're, you're muted. Okay. Yeah. I'm working with two screens here. I apologize. Uh, couldn't find my, my cursor. But the, in any case, um, yes, I, I do want to start with the 60s, but I, I want to say just a bit more before I start with the 60s. Uh, uh, Todd's uh, uh, presentation brought some things to mind that I think need to be pointed out uh, in my presentation. So I, I want to go back to 1896, and I'll, and I'll make a huge skip forward. So 1896, uh, you get Plessy versus Ferguson. And uh, Plessy Fergus versus Ferguson becomes for um, in unintended consequences, the birth of, of modern blackness. Uh, because of Plessy versus Ferguson, you get legalized segregation uh, because you get what everyone has heard of commonly recall, uh, referred to as the one drop rule. One drop of black blood separates you from uh, others, others who are considered to be white. So you get in some ways a legal definition of what it means to be black and a legal definition of what it means to be, to be white. And you have black people who are responding to it in terms of their writing. So you get in some ways um, a, a defiant Du Bois, who's an intellectual academic scholar uh, revolutionary who's writing to, de, re, to res, in response to Plessy versus Ferguson, but also writing uh, to say something about what it means to be uh, black, what it means to be human, and what it means to be free that is outside of and not defined by, by, by law. Because in many ways, the black struggle was the struggle for self-definition, the struggle to say what it means to be human for oneself, the struggle to say what it means to be free for oneself, the struggle to say what it means to be black, by a particular culture that has been black by law, right? So uh, at moving forward from there, that, that period, and there's a large swath of information that I could you know, put in that, to that period that goes all the way to 1965. But at, by the time you get to 1965, you have a huge change uh, of what's going on with black culture. Um, you have to keep in mind that in 1963, John Kennedy has just just uh, been assassinated. Um, and in fact, you, you, you are moving into what's considered by some a new era of assassinations. Uh, you get um, Malcolm X in 1965. Um, and in many ways, Malcolm modeled for um, black people what it meant to be a new black man. Uh, one who is willing to stand in the face of white oppression and to say, yes, I am still here and I matter. Um, when Malcolm dies, um, you get something that's revolutionary um, and he's not the only one, but he just becomes one that we are most familiar with is Leroy Jones moves from Greenwich Village, which is like an artsy type of place in New York City. He moves from there to Harlem. He changes his name to Amiri Baraka. Um, and he, in, in some ways, epitomizes. He doesn't do it on his own, but he epitomizes what it means to go from being the Negro, right? So you had the old Negro it, before 1896. That was the person that had been enslaved and or segregated by, uh, as a consequence of their slavery, you move towards the new Negro um, in the jazz age. Well, by the time you get to uh, 1965, black people don't want to be called Negro anymore, right? Um, they they took that to be something that was uh, that stemmed from uh, the oppression of slavery, and you get a uh, move towards being black and or African American, right? Which is why 
um, many, including myself, you will see um, when we write, we will capitalize uh, the word black in reference to black people in America because it becomes in that sense, a, a proper uh, denotation of who black people are, right? So it's not the same as saying white in that sense, right? Uh, because it replaces the word Negro and can stand in place of the African-American. Um, what's interesting about that is that stimulates um, a, a whole host of movements. So just as when uh, Du Bois writes The Talented 10th, you get the birth of black fraternities and sororities coming out of that on college campuses because they look at Du Bois's and they take themselves to be the Talented 10th. So the same thing happens when Malcolm dies, you get the birth of the Black Panther Party. In 1966, they're looking at Malcolm X and they say, well, they try to be the personification of the ideals that Malcolm had in his speeches. Uh, Malcolm didn't write much, but he did give a lot of speeches. And in those speeches, the personification of what it meant to be black and to, to stand in the face of oppression with a certain type of dignity, they took that to be, to undergird uh, what um, it meant to be black in, in that at that moment. In fact, uh, I think it's Elaine Brown that writes the anthem to the black to the, Nat the black Panthers, and it's uh, entitled uh, "Black Man, Where Have You Been?" Right, and, and so in some ways, the the the, the even the mas masculinity, some would say the hyper masculinity that comes out of hip hop, is grounded by the movement from uh, in those in that particular time period in 1965 and after that you get even a change in religion because by 1969 uh, you get a young graduate student James Cone who um, writes the text black theology black power and, and he makes the profound move from in liberation theology by saying God is black and not only is God black but God is on his side of the oppressed and then by 1973 you get a text by um, Howard Thurman, uh, The Search for Common Ground, but you also get a text in the same year by Huey Newton and Eric Erickson, um, A Search for Common Ground. And, but in the same year, the, the, the text that uh, is in some ways did, doesn't get as big of um, um, notoriety uh, as a text by William Jones. Um, William Jones in 1973 writes the text, Is God a White Racist? Uh, where he takes a, a sort of Kantian type of um, move where he says uh, we should table faith for us and then have a conversation about what is the nature of the God in which we take on, right? Uh, so he does a suspense, instead of a suspension of reason, it's a suspension of faith. And he questions not so much uh, James Cone as a person, but his take on just coloring God black, how does that help? Um, black people if God in his essence, the way in which he has been taught and framed is racist. Um, and so that, that move becomes um, um, in some ways, one of the first um, moments where you now have philosophy of the black experience. So before then you have black philosophers taking up issues of the day there, of course they are gonna be pushed by their material conditions but you get, um, and I'll wrap this up shortly, but you get, um, they're, they're taking up pretty much the same issues that white philosophers are taking. But after 65, you get black people taking philosophical uh, methods and making some analysis into what it means to be black. Um, uh, I don't wanna run over the time, uh, I, but I'll, I'll leave it there and, and, and maybe come back to it. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Neal. Uh, yes, and, and we will have time to um, to follow up with uh, with questions later. Um, we're going to toss the question now to uh, my colleague, Dr. Gail Presby, who I think is going to take us to another uh, story of sunrise, uh, perhaps on another continent. Uh, Gail. Okay, everyone, can you hear me? I hope. <laughs> so I was uh, thinking about th this concept of sunrise and the time in which I ha had the fortune to meet people who would 
challenge the narrower idea of philosophy I had earlier and who introduced me to new philosophical ideas, especially in the field of African philosophy. So even as an undergraduate, I was feeling like the kind of philosophy I was being taught in school. I loved philosophy, by the way, so I was a philosophy undergraduate. I mean, since I was a teenager, I loved uh, philosophy. My dad had a lot of philosophy books in the basement. But as I studied, I felt like I know there's Indian philosophy. You know, multiple different religions being practiced, a field. Of, uh, I didn't really know that there was a field called uh, African philosophy until I was told by a fellow graduate student. So I went to Fordham and one of the other graduate students who was a Jesuit scholastic at the time from Nigeria, Emmanuel Eze, told me, he goes, I'm going uh, to a conference and I'm going to be in a panel on African philosophy. Do you want to come? And I said, what? You know, it's like I, I hadn't heard about it. I said, sure, sure, I'll come. And, and there was a whole panel and people were discussing philosophy in Africa and I didn't know about it. It was all very interesting to me. And it also kind of fed this part of me that always felt like the kind of philosophy I'm being taught is narrow. And so I really wanted to pursue it further. And I went to several conferences and at conferences since I was studying in New York City, I was lucky enough that there were a lot of conferences and seminars, and one of them was Philosophy Born of Struggle, which uh, takes a look at African American philosophy. And I met a lot of uh, scholars through that. And one of them was Lucius Outlaw. And he told me, he said, You should go to Africa and study African philosophy. You know, he said this, you know. We were at the conference, the panel was over, we were hanging around in the hallways of, I think it was the new school for social research. He goes, you should go to Africa. And I go, well, you know, at first I thought, what? And then I said, well, if I go, you know, how, how would I do it? He goes, you have to look up a professor, Odera Aruka. And so I did, okay, there's a long story. I wrote, I never got a letter back. I went anyway, I traced him down. And I've spent uh, quite some time studying his philosophy and uh, African philosophy to find out that he had his own birth. So that was my sunrise, uh, you know, meeting through Emmanuel as a Lucius outlaw, finding out about philosophy born of struggle, studying African philosophy. But Adara Ruka himself had a sunrise. So he was like an earlier sunrise. And I, so I just want to tell you a little bit about his story uh, because he, you know, born in Uganda in uh, Western Kenya and uh, near the Uganda border. And his father was a philosopher, a sage philosopher, but uh, there are Ruka, although he sat at the foot of his father and so many other wise elders of his community, it, it wasn't until he went off to other countries and had academic training that he came back and said, my goodness, my father and these other wise elders are philosophers too. And philosophers have to pay attention to what they have to say. But I get ahead of myself. Adara Ruka first went abroad to study. He got a scholarship to go to Uppsala in Sweden, where he was supposed to study geology, and he did. But while he was there, some students who were interested in African literature met him and said, why don't you come to our book group? We're reading African literature. And so he went to that book group and he made some friends, a close friend of his was studying philosophy and that's Tommy Zane. And so Tommy Zane said, come over to our department, right? And that's how he meets the philosophy department in Uppsala. And he meets a professor called Ingemar Hedinius. So, so this is a book about Hedinius by Svant Nordin. 
And I want to show you because it's got a picture right here. You can see, oh, sorry, it's too hard, sorry. You can see Aruka and Hedinius over there sitting at a table together. So, um, and Aruka has written about his own conversion to studying philosophy. He said he was reading Copleston, does, you know, the arguments for God's existence. And suddenly he had a feeling, I've got to be a philosopher, right? And he gave up geology, studied philosophy. And Hedinius, uh, right after Aruka was getting his, you know, the philosophy was very, you could say, uh, anal analytic, uh, logical, logical empiricism, etc. So uh, Hedinius ended up coming to Detroit, my hometown, and studying at Wayne State University here in Detroit with us. I mean, not studying, teaching. And he did it because there were um, the rebellion, as we call it, sometimes called the riots of Detroit in 1967. And because of it, a lot of, uh, a lot of white people fled the city, including the in, almost the entire philosophy department, which was nabbed as a group to go teach in Bloomington, Indiana, because they all wanted to leave Detroit. And so Hedinius came as a visiting scholar, and, and he organized to bring Adara Aruka with him. And so Adara Aruka, you know, you hear all these things about how great United States are, and then he gets here and finds out there is racism, there is poverty, there is systemic injustice. And so he becomes convinced he needs to address these issues centrally in the philosophy he's doing. And he actually writes his master's thesis on the concept of punishment, which he is very critical about the whole idea of, you know, criminals or individuals who have to be locked up by society. He has a completely different analysis of what's really going on. And it's partly because he has this shocking experience of coming to Detroit and seeing our problems here. Now, he goes back to Uppsala with Houdinius after that year to work on his licentiate and PhD. And it's a kind of interesting story because while Hedinius is in uh, Detroit, the students in Uppsala are protesting because this is 1969 and they're saying, we want a new curriculum. We want to study Marx and Fanon. And it's like Hedinius is like, I have no choice. You know, Hedinius has been doing logical empiricism goes back to Uppsala, gives lectures on Marx and Fanon, and that's how Odera Aruka finds out about these folks. And he starts studying their philosophy, and he starts reading Fanon and Walter Rodney, etc. Okay, so now, Odera Aruka is someone who has always wanted to go back to, to Kenya and be part of what's going on in Africa. So he does that after he graduates. He's, you know, very skeptical of the U.S. He doesn't want to just go get a job in the U.S. He goes back to Kenya, where he meets all these Kenyans at University of Nairobi, like Ngugi Wa Thiango and Taban Liang, and all these folks who are radicalizing the curriculum in University of Nairobi. But he looks at his own department in philosophy, and these kinds of things are not going on there yet. But it's his moment to challenge how philosophy is going to be taught in his own department. But he does it because he be, begins to interact with other philosophers on the continent. For example, Kwasi Waredu is the external examiner and he gets flown from Ghana to Kenya to check exams and meets Odera Ruka and Odera Ruka starts finding out about Waredu and Hutanji and others. And and not only that, but Lucius Outlaw, who I told you before, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Lucius Outlaw, who I told you before, meets Adara Ruka because Lucius Outlaw is back in the US in the early 80s and he's reading everything he can on African-American philosophy and African philosophy and he's writing people he hasn't met yet. And he's able to write Wiridu, Hutanji, and and uh, they connect up 
and uh, Lucius Outlaw, who goes to Haverford for a visiting position, meets Mudimbi there, who's on the faculty there at the time. And he and Mudumbi together say, we've got to you know, study and spread the word about African philosophy. And so, so pretty soon there are conferences. Uh, African-Americans coming to Kenya for a conference in 81, and then uh, Haverford hosting them in 82. And then Adira Ruka comes for visiting position in 83. And so that's how you get these international networks that are saying, we need to develop these diverse things. Uh, philosophy has to address different issues. This is how Adira Ruka gets the inspiration to start his sage philosophy project, where he decides that he is going to interview sages like his own father, Ruka Ranginya, and have them studied as uh, important philosophers in the field of African philosophy. And so there have been these sunrises, they're ongoing. I, this is one of them, I hope, I think, and I hope this too here is one of them. I mean, just uh, chance meetings like this where you find out about a whole field you didn't know about and then you can pursue it. This is how uh, philosophy is growing. And that's why I'm happy to be here today and share these past sunrise stories with you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Presby. Uh, we, we have uh, some other questions that we want to address uh, in a minute, but, but first I just want to share a, a one minute story about um, one of my own sunrises, and that was um, being a passenger in a really tiny car that only had really place for four people to sit uh, in with any comfort at all. And those four people were um, Richard Olson, Karsten Struhl, and Gail Presby. And we were driving up uh, Highway 17 in New York uh, to, I believe, an African Studies Conference, and it was snowing, um, and it was cold. And, and the three editors of the book that would become known as the Philosophical Quest were just nonstop talking about their project the whole way. And I learned a whole lot uh, on that drive through New York. Well, um, so we have sunrises and we have also the image of the water. And you all have represented the water uh, in, in that image as, as quite uh, tempestuous. Uh, we had thought we would spend some time to talk about how we see the tempestuous water, but then we decided at the last minute, well, maybe uh, that kind of goes without saying these days. Uh, we don't have to spend a lot of time talking about the, um, the nature of the tempestuous times we live in. So what we thought we would do is just go ahead and, and go to the, uh, to the third um, question that we have in mind, which is... Um, what the image of the sun suggests to us. It reminds us of an escape from, uh, from Plato's cave. And it reminds us of, of the experience of adjusting our minds to understandings that are liberated from the mere shadows of ideas. And, and so now we wanna think about uh, what, what does this horizon mean to us philosophically? And so to first address that question, uh, we'll ask uh, Dr. Anthony Sean Neal. Anthony? Okay, I was quicker on my unmuting that time, but uh, um, so so as I as I think about this, and we've had some conversations about this earlier, Greg and I, um, and one of the things I didn't get a chance to include um, because I didn't want to go over my six minutes was this idea of philosophy born of struggle um, and the connection between, of course, Lucy's outlaw, Leonard Harris, uh, Leonard Harris being a good friend and a mentor of mine, um, who wrote a book, um, edited work. Uh, called philosophy born of struggle. And also one of his ideas is insurrectionist ethics. So, so Leonard and I have had a lot of conversations and we agree on a lot of different things, but one of the conversations we've had is this idea of how do we understand struggle uh, in terms of uh, future, future orientations, things of this nature. And I'm always one to try to, to think that there is something to, to be said for 
being uh, um, active. Um, Hannah Arendt teaches us about um, the active life, but I'm always um, one to also say that uh, to, to not give up on the contemplative life and, and how to hold those intentions. I think there's something to be said about this idea of being active and being and having moments of being passive at the same time. And by passive, I don't mean uh, passive in the, in the sense of uh, being apathetic. I mean, passive in the sense of non-active, right? I, I think in some ways those two go hand in hand. Um, I think that um, we, when we think of struggle in that sense, I, I think when we, when we consider, um, um, healthcare as it pertains to, to, to Black people in the U.S. And, and other places, this idea of always being um, in the face of, of, of some type of active participation in struggle has a, a lot of uh, implications for heart disease, um, high blood pressure, and all of those kinds of things. Right? So, so in some ways, um, I, I think it's unique that some of the uh, philosophers I, I really enjoy reading um, built these cabins or out of the way houses such that they could go out in the woods and, and just take time to be at peace. Right? And I think that that's something that's part of what it means to be human and that we shouldn't want to lose that part. And also, um, um, you know, you know it's, I have a, a lot of friends that will write about um, certain types of, of active revolution, violent revolution, things of this nature. I think sometimes we have to consider those things, but I think also we want to cons what we want to consider is what we want to be. Um, Howard Thurman, one of the philosophers I've written about and, and think about a lot, says that we should be we should be considerate about um, how we become and our becoming. So in that in that sense, we should also want to not lose sight of this this idea of love. Um, it's an abstract concept, but we don't want to lose sight of what that means. And we don't want to lose sight of, uh, of the human we want to become. Right? So I think that, you know, being active in terms of struggle is good. But I also think that being passive, having a moment of creating your own peace. Right? I, I, I like what the, uh, the young lady said about the, the, the hip hop, a certain type of hip hop that doesn't get promoted um, many times commercially, that has to do with this idea of, of creating and thinking about your own piece, this act, act, uh, periods of activity and periods of inactivity. Uh, thank you. Stop too uh, abruptly. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. <laughs> Neal. Uh, and and so now we will turn to uh, the question to uh, Gail Presby. Um, Dr. Gail, what do you see on the horizon uh, philosophically? Well, I I just want to say we we each need to, in our own way, in our own expression, uh, bring philosophy to the the issues and topics that we uh, most think are important. We can do those step-by-step step and in a lot of different ways, uh, whether it's how we teach our classes or how we interact with our colleagues, either in our departments or at conferences. And also, since you mentioned my textbook, also in the way that we publish, and of course, uh, you all know that here at OPP, that's that's what you're doing. You're you're engaged in publications that are, are redefining philosophy, like it always has to be redefined, and and uh, showing showing a new way through the way that you gather together voices that uh, otherwise uh, would have been uh, neglected or or not taught or not considered philosophy. Put, uh, put them together, we learn from each other and we can hand this on to uh, the upcoming uh, generations of philosophy students and change our field. A lot of other uh, fields have been changing over the decades. They've been 
uh, challenging uh, things like racism and sexism in their you know curriculums and and other other issues like that if it's english if it's history and uh, philosophy we need to do the same and I know sometimes there's some pushback. This idea of philosophy is, you know, timeless or doesn't need a context. But in fact, uh, the the so-called timeless philosophers we keep coming back to, they did have a context, and we need to study that as well as study the current situation and and find the voice, the reflective voice, as we just heard the. The, the reflective voice uh, that asks questions about uh, values, asks what's important, and asks how we should live our lives. All of these kinds of questions need to be uh, thought anew in our contemporary context. So that's what I would hope uh, we would all have a chance to do and make our own contribution the way we can. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Presby. Um, and so now I believe uh, we will be uh, passing this back uh, for um, questions. So we will be passing this back to uh, Val, uh, who has uh, graciously agreed to chair uh, the Q&A. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you all for, um, for sharing. Um, this is a this was a really great kind of personal personal experience as well as a kind of historical overview that I think was really touching and really um, useful as well. I think um, so. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, to to reiterate, um, Greg Moses, um, please do somehow make yourself known um, if you have a question. Post something in the chat. Raise a Zoom hand come onto video and raise a physical hand, um, any of that would work. Um, to get us started, um, I have one question, comment, pondering thought. Um, and this is kind of um, drawing a connection also um, to Taig and um, his conversation with us earlier. Um, so the idea of language mattering, um, and the subject matter not mattering. Um, I think this idea of mattering, I think is really interesting, especially in, in philosophy, both um, in terms of as, as a philosophical concept and, um, you know, someone, um, uh, well, I'm, I'm an ancient philosophy and kind of the idea of, of, of mattering um, is often thought to be one of kind of the first philosophical thoughts um, to, to come into existence in the ancient world. Um, so that's that's always on, on my mind. Um, but I think as well, as also what matters in philosophy and as philosophy is something that we think less about and I think we should think more about. Um, so um, Anthony talked about kind of um, using the word black um, and kind of how how you speak to people and kind of capitalizing certain words that matter um, is important. Um, but then we also heard from, from Taig earlier in terms of um, kind of the line between different disciplines or different forms um, maybe matter less than we think that they do. Um, so I was, I was wondering um, if any of you um, had something to say about this idea of mattering and how we can take that further in philosophy today as um, something to, to help us to change our discipline for, for the better. I have something I like to say on that. Um, so one of the people I've written about, and I've missed his name several times here, um, Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman um, made a quote once, um, according to Luther Smith, that um, he said, how can I think life matters if my own life doesn't matter, right? because he was told to think about all of these other types of thinkers and the, the eternal issues that plague man's souls or whatever and and he says well wait a minute i have to start 
with myself. And I, you know, uh, you know, in a, in the Ghanaian kind of tradition, the Dinka symbols, one that's most important to me is Sankofa, right? So I, I think of, you know, I, I, I've written in, in terms of this idea of reclamation, going back and doing, uh, reclaiming these ideas that people have already asked questions about um, and, and, and try to reshape them and, and understand them for me. But then I also think, uh, I take something from uh, uh, Leonard Harris, he said, uh, and it, it really makes me think, and it's, I, I don't know, I still wrestle with this, but he, you know, he takes this idea that, uh, of Aristotle, he challenges this idea that philosophy is born out of, out of wonder, right? And, and you know, this aporia, right? And he says, no, no, philosophy in some sense is, is, is a value judgment. Value becomes the, the first thing, right? Which is how he comes out of philosophy born of struggle. We take on these issues, not because we just wonder about them many times, we take on these issues because they're important to us, right? It, it matters, freedom matters to me. Right. When I write about freedom, I'm not just writing about it because it's it's something it's a concept I heard about. It matters to me what it means to be human. That matters to me. Right? I, it's not something I just write about as, as, as a game of chance. Uh, what it means to be black, how blackness is defined and how people understand that means something to me. That's important to me. I write about that because it's important to me. Now, maybe there's some issues in the future I will write about just because I wonder about them. But, but the things that I take to be, that I write about and put in the front, the forefront of what I, what I write about, I write about them because they are, they, I have, uh, I'm attached to them with, with, uh, in terms of their value because they have, they have value for me. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, um, that was a really great way to, to think about what matters in, in philosophy is what, what matters to, the philosopher, yeah. Um, and I think, um, kind of, Gail, you have something to say. Say it, please. <laughs> well, and especially because you said, oh, I study ancient philosophy. And so that was reminding me of, you know, Enrique Dusso has this very large book, Ethics. It's translated into English. I mean, he has many books. But in that book, he says, if we take a look for the earliest signs of philosophy, he, he sees that, that in, in the various uh, traditions, if you're looking at ancient Egypt, if you're looking at Babylonia, you know, other parts of the Middle East, he says, the question you see everywhere is about justice. What is justice? What is injustice? He wants to say that's the motive. So for him, that's the, the first, the motivating questions pe people have a sense they have a sense when things are wrong or unjust and they want to denounce that injustice and cry out for justice. He finds that as a key theme across the ancient world. And I know when I, I teach students some of the ancient Egyptian texts, I would mention, you know, dialogue between a man and his soul or instruction of any or uh, eloquent peasant, tale of the eloquent peasant. All of these are, are asking about questions of injustice and how to notice it, how to address it, how to argue for your position. So when I, even this semester, you know, I'm teaching introduction to philosophy and all my students I have is their first paper assignment. What do you think is the biggest injustice, right? And give your reasons for it. And then uh, what should we do about it? And so I say, because a philosophical question has to be, interesting it has to be significant you can't be like bored it's like and i tell my students okay you're writing about what you think is the world's biggest injustice i you know i hope you're you're motivated to come up with a good argument or to study it and maybe change your position but uh so i i often think about that i mean of course, I didn't mention Plato, but you know, Socrates or the Republic, what is justice? So, I mean, so many of our key, the Buddha, right? So, the Buddha, uh, the Asalayana Sutra, you know, caste discrimination. What's the argument in favor of caste discrimination? And he just, you know, takes Asalayana, you know, step by step, you know, 
well, you have to admit this, don't you? And this and this. So why would there be a difference of treatment and caste? That's the ancient world, you know? So uh, that's one of the issues that I think, you know, so just building on this idea of philosophy is value judgment, what's important to me, what matters. I, I think of that as a key theme in philosophy. Yeah, thank, thanks so much for that, Gail. Um, Greg, I wonder if you have anything to add? I, I would just uh, pick up on what Gail said about what we do in our teaching. Because I think sometimes when people are teaching a particular text, they have in mind a landing place. In other words, there's a, there's a particular spot in the text where they think the students should gravitate. And I resist that in, in my own teaching. And I present the text to the students and say, you know, what, wh where, where's the sentence for you? What's, what's the landing place in this text for you? And then let's, you know, let's, let's talk about our different landing places and see what, what happens when we do that. Um, and, and so I think this, this notion of, uh, of, of um, always being open uh, to the interest of the student, just as we demand that philosophy be open to our own interests, is something we can do to, uh, to cultivate uh, the, general, uh, the general idea. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um... Yeah, I have to say, like, I wish that um, I had had you three as, as my teachers when I was studying philosophy. Um, I think it, it would have made a world, a world of difference in, in, in my experience um, of the subject. Um, and yeah, um, I'm very jealous of your, your current students, yeah. Um, I think um, we're kind of slightly running out of time. Um, so sorry, we don't have any more time for, for questions. Um, but thank you, thank you all for, for, for sharing your, your thoughts on this. Um, I've really enjoyed this evening. I hope you have as well. Um, so yeah, without, without further ado, um, we have come to the, the launch of turn two. This is a very, very exciting moment. Um, and yeah, I hope you will all kind of um, take the time to, to read and think about these pieces. Um, we've had uh, discussions today that um, reflect um, what has been written. Um, a lot of what has been written hasn't been discussed today. Um, so do take, take your time um, to explore what's there. Um, I wonder if, Cody, could you share your screen for turn two? Because I think my, uh, my laptop can't, can't take it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah. Um, so we'll just um, share. I cannot. Oh, you cannot share a screen. Okay. Okay. Um, let's let's um, hope this works for my Zoom then. Um, so um, we'll just share. Um, turn the turn to screen so you have a chance um, to explore what that looks like um, for a little while um, before you go oh I think I'm gone oh no I'm there okay <laughs> so just as this page is slowly loading on my laptop please bear with me again um, we'll um, share some some thanks that we have um, for the OPP team um, so um, first of all the website um, has been very painstakingly and very lovingly designed and put together by Zed Not. Um, Zed is also the very very wonderful OPP illustrator um, OPP, as, as you might know, um, is a collective, so design decisions and playlist compilation, um, as well as editing, were all a collaborative effort, but we owe particular thanks um, to the following people. So Amir Kadobai, Anna Genevieve Winham, Anushka Shah, B. Ratliff, um, Chelsea Wallace, Connie Bostock, Emily Passmore, Emma Rath, Jonathan Ejid, Catherine Franco, Lucas Yantz, Nathan Allen, He Young Tay, and Alice Hank Winham. Um, so thanks all of these people in particular, but thank you um, ever so much to all of our contributors. Um, and thank you all for coming today. Um, and thank you generally for, for making philosophy um, just a slightly better place and um, more interesting for everyone else. Um, so just um, to end, um, 
for you. I will share a last bit of slide. Um, so um, we are all kind of um, very keen to have um, further contributions for turn three, which is um, we'll be starting to recruit for um, over the, the over the coming weeks um, and especially the winter the winter break. Um, so here you just have a few QR codes that you might want to snap um, and yeah so we're looking for new members um, and new contributions and always thank you for for contributing I'm sure we'll be in touch with you again um, very soon um, so yeah thank you thank you so much for coming um, and sharing this evening with us thank you